He is risen. Yes, what a great public declaration of truth that Jesus came to earth 2,000 years ago. He was crucified on a cross in our place for our sin, having paid our sin fully with God the Father being satisfied. His body was wrapped and covered with aloes and myrrh and put into a cold, dark tomb. And on the first day of the week, the ladies went to the tomb early in the morning and found the tomb was empty. Our Savior is risen bodily forever, living in the power of an endless life, and he is offering the gift of eternal life to all who will believe. What glorious news for a world that has gone far astray from the Lord, opposed and in re rebellion against God, that God would love us so much. Wow, praise God that we can be together on this December the 4th and celebrate and enjoy the Lord forever. So this is a wonderful morning. We just had our Night in Bethlehem tour the last couple of nights. I think we had over 320 people here that were from the community to hear the gospel. Thank you for everybody who was involved. Whether you prayed, you helped uh, prepare, you brought some treats, you decorated, you performed, um, whatever you did. I, I went through all of the different scenes last night as the last tour group. And wow, every single thing was fantastic. It, the gospel was clear. It was absolutely beautiful. And it, isn't it fun to work together for the glory of God? I just love this church family. It was absolutely a, a spectacular time. I'm just so, so very happy. So thank you all, church, for great, great days of ministry. Praise God. Praise God. We're going to sing some of our familiar Christmas carols this morning. Um, when I went through detail by detail from the screen, I think everything matches with your hymn book. I think in the hymnal, although on the second hymn, Angels We Have Heard on High, I don't remember. If there's three or four verses, I don't know. We're going to sing whatever's on the front screen. I tried to make it all match up. But let's stand together and sing our opening hymn, 199, O Come All Ye Faithful. Let's go to the Lord this morning in prayer. 
Father in heaven, we come before your throne of grace this morning. We thank you so much for Jesus Christ. We thank you for our common salvation in him, and we thank you for your simple plan of salvation that by through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone, we can know we have eternal life. And Father, thank you so much for giving us the last couple of evenings with the community as hundreds of them came in and got to hear the message of salvation, your simple substitutionary method that Christ died for our sins and rose again. We thank you for sending open um, hearts and minds to come through. And thank you so much for all of the people who Uh, participated in that and how the gospel went out to the community. We pray and give you thanks for Pastor Weida and his willingness to, by faith, step out and study the Word of God and uh, prepare a message for us this morning. We pray that the Spirit would work in and through him to deliver us a message. And we thank you even for, on, on this cold morning, we thank you for the warm building and our fellow brethren and believers and uh, alike that can spend the morning with us hearing the Word of God. And I just would pray, Father, that you would prepare our minds to receive your Word this morning and that by faith we would apply it throughout the week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, church. Let's read scripture together. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take you, Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. Good morning. morning. All right, we'll start with um, choir is practicing this evening at 5 p.m. So if you're in the choir, try to be here for practice. And then following that, there'll be a short uh, worship service because there's a lot going on tonight. There's election of all the officers and then also the 2023 budget meeting tonight at 6 p.m. So try to be here tonight for all that um, wonderful stuff. And then Tuesday, we're gonna, um, the men's Bible study will start back up at Travis's home on Mungershaw at 6.30 p.m. for the men's Bible study on Tuesday. And then Wednesday is just back to normal too with prayer and praise at 6.30 with the uh, Conquerors Club and youth group. And then dinner is before that at 5.30 and it's tacos? No. No. Breakfast. Breakfast. Breakfast for dinner. So that's this Wednesday. So sounds good. And then um, Saturday morning There's a marriage ministry at 9 a.m. here at the church. And then following that, if you're a young adult, they have a activity out at Cloquet. I guess it's the Pinehurst. I don't know where that is, but if you have any questions about this, uh, you can see Brianna or Zach Dean. And that's at 1 p.m. in Cloquet. Bring your own sleds. So that's for all the young adults. Um, And then Wednesday, December 14th, Tom Myers will be here. He is a Bible memory man. Um, he'll be here on Wednesday, the 14th at 6 p.m. So, so that everybody will be up here for that then, Pastor? Like youth group and stuff? Youth group and adults. Okay. So. Will go on as well. Okay. So that's a couple weeks. And then um, the Christmas Eve service, 
of course, is the 24th. We'll be here on, it's a Saturday at 6 p.m. We have a little um, thing in the back if you're interested, you can hand them out. It's got the dates, the time, the address of the church. It's got a candy cane in the back. You can either take that for yourself or leave it on there. But no, you should leave it on there because I see it's got the candy cane story in the back. It tells you what the candy cane represents. So then we're in the back if you'd like to hand them out. Um, so Christmas Eve service is at 6 p.m. And then Christmas Day is on a Sunday. And we're going to have a 10 a.m. Christmas Day service. So, and then there'll be no Sunday school or evening service. So just one service Christmas Day. Um, at 10 and the Christmas um, the children's Christmas program is going to be Sunday December 18th on Sunday night and of course they've been practicing and they have some practice dates I'll let you know um, I'll let you know the practice dates but if you want to know uh, the practice dates they will be on the QR thing if you all oh, the Dana <laughs> <laughs> It's hard enough doing this. <laughs> no, I have to be nice to Dana. So. <laughs> Anyways, um, I'm easily distracted. <laughs> all right, practice um, for all the kids. If uh, um, December 9th, next Friday at 6 p.m., and then December 17th is a Saturday at 12 p.m., and December 11th and 18th, It'll be Sunday school time. So all these will be on the QR code thing. So if you go back there, in, all the announcements are on the QR code, all the times and dates. If you want to look at them in print, you can get that. And so all the time, so you have it all. Um, and then the Christmas card bulletin will be downstairs. So this year when you're making your Christmas cards, make an extra one for the church. They'll have a bulletin so you can put it down there so all the church can see your Christmas cards. And I think that is it for announcements. So, and our next song will be Angels We Have Heard on High. Three verses, not four. Right. Just three.
All right, good morning. So first we have a, a brief youth update for our youth Christmas party. So this year we're going to be having our Christmas party. It's going to be December 10th, so it's coming Saturday here. Uh, we'll be having it at Eli and Serena Tigris house. Uh, we're also going to be bowling. So the time frame is going to be 4 to 8 p.m. So we're going to leave the church. We're going to take the church van at 4 p.m., uh, which means don't show up at the church at 4. So we're supposed to drive away at 4, but we'll do our best. So we're supposed to leave the church at 4 p.m. We're going to head the skyline for bowling. Um, and then from there, we'll take the van to Eli and Serena's house uh, for devotion time, some food and some games and gift exchange and things like that. Uh, we plan to be back at the church around 8 to 8.15 p.m. Uh, each youth should bring a $10 gift for the gift exchange. So that's the plan for uh, December 10th. So leave the church at 4, be back around 8, 8.15 so other than that, we'll have our usual time of prayer for an unreached people group. Also, one of our missionaries will be praying for Larry and Jane Parks over in Spain, and they've been there for many, many years, faithfully serving, planting churches, discipleship. Uh, their, their testimony and their ministry has uh, been very, has impacted a lot of people in the time they've, they've spent there. So we'll be praying for them and their ministry. And then also um, for our Unreached People group, and remember there's cards in the back on the entryway right next to Migdal Etter, right? Because they probably had an entryway table there for announcements as well. Um, so it is the, the Arab people, uh, the Emirati in the United, United Arab Emirates, or the UAE as it's known. Uh, so this is a group of people. Their world population spans about 7 million. Uh, their population in the UAE is about 1.1 1, about 1. 1 million. Uh, they speak Arabic, uh, more their, the Gulf dialect of that at least. Their primary religion is Islam. Uh, they have portions of the scripture in their own language. And there's a couple resources as well. So it's estimated, as it says on the small sheet, it kind of lists out evangelicals or Christian adherents in kind of two different categories. Uh, so it's roughly 0.3 to 0.4% of that one million would be even professing to be Christians. So another one of those areas uh, that is very difficult uh, to reach with the gospel within that 1040 window. And one of these times we'll actually put the, the 1040 window on the slides. So you kind of have an idea of what that is. So maybe in the coming weeks we'll uh, spend a couple minutes talking about that because that gets mentioned a lot. You may hear about that in the context of missions, um, but maybe you've never seen that window or, and there's various statistics that go with it as well. Uh, so we'll be praying for, for this group of people. Uh, any, any people group within that area, especially when their primary religion is Islam, is very difficult to reach uh, with the gospel. Uh, difficult places just to live, uh, just visiting there, living there, to have a job would be difficult in and of itself, um, let alone to go there for the sake of the gospel. Typically, you can't even go there saying, you know, you're a pastor or a church planter or whatever. You have to go on the basis of being either a nurse or a doctor or a teacher or things like that. And even then, uh, you might not get into some of these countries. Uh, so we'll be praying for Larry and Jane Parks in Spain and then also this unreached people group. So let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, uh, how grateful we are for the gospel. Lord, how thankful we are for missionaries, those that you have worked in, in their lives and have called and set apart uh, to the work of the gospel, Lord, overseas and in various other areas. So, Lord, we're thankful for the parks and their long and faithful ministry for the sake of the gospel in Spain. What a blessing they have been uh, to us. What a blessing they have been to so many people over the years, over where they are serving. So, Lord, we'd ask that you would continue to guide and direct their ministry uh, Father, give them grace to endure whatever trials they may be going through uh, in this present time. Lord, may you work in the hearts of the people that they are ministering to as well, softening the hearts to the gospel and growing and unifying the church over there in Spain. Lord, we want to pray for uh, this group of people in the UAE as well, uh, spanning about one million, Lord, in that country that uh, do not know the gospel. They do not know Christ. Uh, they have not experienced uh, his grace, uh, Lord, given through his death on the cross and his resurrection, uh, those concepts are foreign to them. Lord, they're stuck in a, a false religion working their way to please an angry God. That is what they think. That is what uh, they are being taught by their teachers in Islam. And Father, we know that's not the truth. We know that's not what the Bible teaches. Uh, so Lord, uh, may you cause our hearts to ache for this group of people. 
Lord, with all the, the lost souls that are destined to spend an eternity in the lake of fire as of right now. And Father, may we diligently pray uh, that men and women would be raised up to be sent to this country, that they'd be willing to give uh, their lives, give their livelihood, to do whatever it takes, to stay as long as it takes uh, to minister, to spread the gospel, and to plant a healthy church in that area. Lord, a church that can, is worshiping the one true God in the proper fashion, in the proper mode, Lord, a church that is discipling one another and is evangelistic, Lord, and even going and planting more churches. Uh, that is our desire uh, for this group of people and for this region. Lord, we know it's a difficult work, but we know nothing is impossible for you, for you are God. Uh, so, Lord, we're thankful for the gospel. We're thankful for the freedoms that we have in this country. And we'd always continue to remember and to pray for our leaders and those in high positions, those in elected offices, that you'd grant them uh, wisdom to lead well, to do as they ought to, upholding what is good and punishing what is evil. Lord, if it is your will and your desire, may you even use us or others to call our leaders to the gospel of Jesus Christ. May they understand their sin and their need for Christ, and may they turn to the one solution. Lord, for we know the only way to the Father is through the Son, Jesus Christ. So we're thankful for your grace, thankful for your guidance. Lord, we're thankful for your heart and your love uh, for the lost and for the unreached. And we'd ask your blessing on our service as we continue. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. So our last hymn will be hymn 198, What Child Is This? It'll also be on the screen, and it also has three verses that we'll be singing.
Today's scripture is Luke 6, 27 through 36. Okay, let's begin. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. To him who strikes you, excuse me, to him who strikes you on the one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you, and from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. But love your enemies, do good, and lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be the sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore, be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. Children's Church is dismissed. Well, praise the Lord. I pray and hope that your heart is full and you've been thinking scriptures, you've been singing them, we've been um, just enjoying who Jesus is and all that he has accomplished on our behalf. We are in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, and we are looking at what I call the Disciple Sermon. You have a similar sermon in Matthew 5 through 7, which is the Sermon on the Kingdom. But I do believe this Luke 6 sermon is, a little, is quite a bit different. There's some similarities, some similar illustrations and examples. But um, we'll, we'll begin looking at that Luke 6 text in just a moment. But before we do, um, I'd like you to go to Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, for one verse to kind of set the stage for what I see as the theme of Luke 6. Matthew 13, verse 44. And let's pray. Our Father, we bow before you, and we are so, so happy, and we're so thankful for Jesus. It is such a joy to study his life, to look at his teaching and his example, and to see that he gave his life for us, that we might be restored in relationship to you. He bore our sin in his own body on the tree. What suffering. We, we can't imagine the agony of Jesus on the cross when you turned your back to him and you didn't look upon him for fellowship or favor, just a separation in the Godhead as he bore our penalty for what for us would be an eternity. Oh, the anguish and torment to his soul. So much so, Father, that when he anticipated it, he sweat drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. But we are so thankful that now as believers, as children of the Most High God, we can be disciples, we can be learners from the Master and live lives with character and integrity, with blamelessness and even holiness, because you are holy. And we pray now for those who are, are believers, that, that they would follow you with a whole heart. They would love your word and hear it and obey and for those without relationship today, maybe they are stuck in religion, they are stuck in rit rituals and religion and their own works, or maybe even in ignorance, not knowing that you even exist. May today be their day of salvation, eternal life, and do all these things for the glory of Christ, our Savior. Amen. 
Matthew 13, verse 44, as we continue on in the life of Jesus, he has just called in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, his 12 disciples out of a multitude. Jesus has gathered quite a multitude in his ministry, and many people are following, men and women, I'm sure boys and girls, just whole groups of people. And, and after a whole night of prayer, he comes down from a mountaintop, and he gathers all of his large multitude of, of followers, and he, he chooses 12 disciples. These are the men, except for Judas Iscariot, who is the betrayer. These 11, plus then one more, are going to be the foundation of our church. Why we gather together today is because of the labor and the ministry of those 12 apostles. And so in Luke 6, he's, he's explaining, what is the character of a disciple? What are we to be like as people of God? And to kind of set the stage, look at Matthew 13, verse 44, a parable, again, Jesus says, speaking about this kingdom age, this age between the first coming and the second coming, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Now, I want you to picture this parable, this story or illustration Jesus is giving us. So there's a man who is coming across this vacant field, weeds and junk, maybe broken chariot parts. It's just an unused field that somebody owns. And as he's going along in this field, he looks down and he finds a treasure. He finds this expensive, valuable thing. And so he picks it up, maybe looks at it. And then he thinks, I, I want to have this this, so he buries the treasure, he hides the treasure on the field, and then he goes back to his house. And while the community is around him is watching, he is selling everything he has. Joyfully, it says. It says, the, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found, as he's walking through this field, and, and he, he hides it. He's He's, um, he's never seen anything like this before. It's so glorious. And then for joy over it, you see he's got a great joy for this treasure. He goes and sells all that he has. What do you think the neighbors are thinking? They're thinking, this man is crazy. What are you doing, sir? What are you doing, neighbor? You are selling all of your furniture. Why are you selling your couches and beds? He's like, I can't tell you, but, but I'm happy to do it. And they're like, okay, but now why are you getting rid of all of these items in your kitchen? Why are you getting rid of your pots and pans? And why are you selling your oxen and donkeys? And what about all your sheep? Why are you selling all of your sheep? And he's like, I can't tell you, but I'm so happy to do it. I feel liberated. I am glad and joyful to sell all that I have because he knows he has got something that is far more valuable than all of those earthly things in his house. Do you see that? He is willing to lose everything in his earthly sphere because he knows that with great joy, the, the value of this treasure is far, far greater than anything. And everybody thinks he's a, the loser in the deal. He knows he's the, he's the gain. He's the winner because what he has for the treasure in the field far outweighs anything else. Do you see the kind of that heart of a disciple, the heart People think we followers of Jesus are crazy. They think we are losing our life on earth, coming to church, singing songs of praise, spending time in the word, putting on a night in Bethlehem, having donkeys in the entryway. Um, I mean, people think you're nuts. Why would you do that with such new carpet? And, and why have all these people in the church? It just makes a mess. And we're like, for joy over the gospel, over Jesus Christ. He is so worth it. We just want people to hear the gospel and be saved, right? That, that is the glory of it all. Well, we have found something worth losing everything over. That's the heart of a disciple. Now, is that your relationship with Jesus? Do you feel like Jesus is so worth it? He is so valuable. He is so awesome and magnificent that you are willing to lay aside everything that you planned, your agenda, everything that you have, if only you can bring glory to Jesus with your life. And this is the idea. Now, as we look at Luke chapter 6, go with, go with me into Luke chapter 6, verse 20. 
This is the sermon for the disciples. It's the disciples, disciples' sermon. Verse 20, then he lifted up his eyes. He's got this huge multitude. He's got the 12 right close to him. He's got dozens more around them. And then he's got the whole multitude from around the surrounding region that want to get healed around them. But who is he specifically speaking to? Verse 20 says he lifted up his eyes toward his disciples, and here's what he said. Now, I covered this text last Sunday night, so I won't go in depth, but it all fits together. So there's going to be four blessings and four woes, four and four. Here's what he says. Blessed are you, poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Remember, he's talking to his followers, his disciples, He's saying, there is great favor and happiness and joy for you disciples when you're poor, because yours is the kingdom of God. Verse 21, blessed are you, or God's favor and great joy and happiness is upon you when you are hungry right now. Your stomachs are empty and you're, you're, you're panging for food. There's a blessing and a favor of God when you're hungry. And it says, because you shall in the future be filled does this, do you see how contrary this is to the world? The world says, if you're hungry, it's not a good thing. If you're poor, it's not a good thing. And, and then verse 21, the second half says, blessed or God's favor and joy and his countenance and your happiness is, will be upon you who weep now, for you shall laugh. The world does not like, like to weep. The world loves to party and laugh and and, and riot and, and all of those things. Verse 22, this is the key. Blessed are you when men hate you and when they exclude you. Really? Is that a blessing when people hate me and when they exclude me? When they revile me and when they cast out um, my name as evil? Brian Weeda, blah, 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 evil. I mean, should I just say, man, am I happy today? Oh, I wish more people would speak bad about me. And you know what? I wish I didn't have any food. I'm going to throw all my food away. And man, I, you know, I'm going to hurt myself. So I start crying because God loves tears more than he likes laughter. And this is the kind of God I serve. Is that the idea? No, because the condition is at the end here. Verse 22, when you, when all of the, when you are poor, when you're hungry, and when you weep, and when men hate you and they exclude you, for the Son of Man's sake... For the Son of Man's sake. Do you know why you're hungry? Jesus is telling his disciples. Because you have identified with me and you are following me with the whole heart. Now, I don't think you get it. I can tell you don't get it yet. So let me tell you this. If you were living in Jesus' day, almost everybody had a government job of some kind. Because you were either paying taxes to the Romans or you were working in one of those industries. Or the temple ministry was huge. The temple was not just a religious place where you offered an animal sacrifice. It was a business. They, the temple employed thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And if you told people, I am a follower of Jesus of Nazareth, he is God in flesh, he was crucified and risen, and it just happened weeks ago, and now I follow Jesus, they would say, you lost your job, get out. We want nothing more to do with your kind. The Romans hated Christians. They tolerated Judaism. So if you, were a Jew, if you were part of the Jewish faith, the Jewish religion, Rome had no problem with you. Go to your synagogues, do what you want. But if you were a Christian, the Romans said, we're not going to give you any money. We're not going to give you any help, no assistance. You, don't have, you get no job with the Roman government. You get no job with the temple or the Jewish people. You are going to be hungry. To put it in today's vernacular or style, it would be like this. I have a job. I'm working here and I'm working at the church or at the school. And if the school were to say, you have to acknowledge people's genderlessness or non-binary or, oh man, I don't even know what, job, what they're all called or what they, but if the school were to say, you have to acknowledge this or you are fired, I would say, you have to fire me. Because I will not do that. I will not lie to our students. Now I'm going to lose my paycheck there. And then the government says to me as a pastor, you have to marry homosexuals. You have to counsel them to be married, and you have to, you have to approve that. I will say, I cannot do that, and they're going to put me in, in prison. And so now I'm hungry, I'm um, hated, I'm excluded, I'm reviled for the son of man's sake. Why? 
Because I am not compromising with God's word, I am going to be a faithful, loyal follower to Jesus. So Jesus is talking to his disciples and and he's telling them, in the days to come, you are going to be hungry for my sake. People will not feed you because you identify with Jesus. You will weep because they will hurt you. They will persecute you as they did the prophets. Do you see why they're hungry and poor? It's not because poor people go to heaven and rich people don't. They're poor because of Jesus, because they stood up and said, I am following Jesus. Now, in our country, can you imagine if every genuine believer said, I am not going to compromise God's word. What God's word says by the Holy Spirit's power, I will do. I will live according to the New Testament precepts for the church, regardless of the consequences, which means I'm not going to do a lot of things the world endorses. I'm not going to do, as a matter of fact, anything the world endorses, I am suspect of. And I am going to wholeheartedly follow Jesus' teachings, which the world despises and hates. Can you imagine what kind of impact that would have on our country? So this is what discipleship is. Discipleship is so... It's not being obnoxious. It's not being evil and mean and cruel with the gospel. It is simply saying, I am going to act like Christ and live like Christ. And since the world hated him, they're going to hate me. It just comes with the, it comes with the program of discipleship. So then he's telling the woe is verse 24. Oh, verse 21. Let's, just, let's finish verse 23. Rejoice in that day. I can find joy being persecuted for my faith. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for indeed your reward is great in heaven. The reason I'm leaping for joy for my poverty is not because I'm a lazy person, I don't know how to handle my finances, or I gambled it all at the casino. The reason I'm poor and weeping and hungry and persecuted is because of my love for Jesus. And I'm going to count that great joy and I'm going to leap, like literally leap for joy, like the man who sold everything that he might buy this treasure, that he might buy this field with the treasure in it. Indeed, your reward is great in heaven. Do you know where we're looking for reward? Not here on earth. I don't expect the world to exalt me and and throw money my way and and privilege and power. I don't expect the I don't I don't expect anything from this world. My reward is coming from Christ. And that is the greatest reward. That is, I, aren't you willing to just say this world does not matter and the things of this world aren't the things I'm holding on to because my reward is far greater coming from Jesus in heaven? What would you want? Would you want your whole rich life on earth with every pleasure and every closet full and, and many houses and vacations, but you die with no reward in heaven? Or would you rather just get through this world living for Jesus and get a great reward later? It's called, get this, delayed gratification. Do you know what our, our culture teaches? Immediate gratification. Oh, Facebook. You scroll on Facebook, they are keeping track of how long you stay on an ad. If you are scrolling and you look at an ad for even a half a second, their algorithms pick that up and then boom, 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 they've got you programmed. They know just what you want, so they're going to stay on that. And man, you want immediate gratification? Oh, on Amazon Prime, you don't even have to put it into the cart. You can slide the button, buy it instantly with one click. That's convenient. Do you you see how we are trained? And Jesus is saying, no, this is not the way of Christ. All right? So he's going to go on at the end of verse 23. For in like manner their fathers did to the prophets. Just like the Jewish leaders and the Jewish people did to their own prophets, so our culture will do to us if we're following Christ. We're not talking about a way of salvation. We're talking about after you're born again, as a disciple, as a follower of Jesus, how will you, what's your character like? Well, verse 24, now there's four woes. I, I like what Leon Morris says about the word woe here in the Greek. It's not, more, it's not like such a condemnation as it is a lamentation. Uh, it's more of a grieving and mourning for the way that we're living. 
So it's not a way of salvation. It's not saying rich people now go to hell. He's saying, but woe to you, you disciples. Woe to you disciples who are rich. Why are they rich? It's not because rich people are bad. It's because they have not identified with Jesus publicly. They're, they're saying, I'm a secret Christian, and I'm just going to have my money and live with it. I'm not gonna, if I stand up for Christ, I'm going to lose my money, and I'd rather keep my money right now. Woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Enjoy your money on earth, because guess what? I, I always tell Melissa this. Where is she? Right here. I always tell Melissa this. Everything we buy is going in a dumpster. Do you know that? I don't care if it's a new pillow, a new picture, a new dish. <sighs> Someday it's going in a dumpster, and I'm going to go in a box in the ground. That's it. I mean, if we're going to put all of our value into those things, and they're going to end up in a dumpster in the Rice Lake Landfill, I'm like, hey, this is nice, but Rice Lake Landfill, here it comes. Not now, maybe 20 years, but it's just the fact of life. Here, woe to you who are rich. For, that, for right now, you're, that's all you get. You've received your consolation. That's your reward. Verse 25, woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Yeah, you know where there's mourning and weeping and things? It's, it's at the reward seat. When you look at your life and you said, I could have lived for Christ and I didn't. You know, I always tell Melissa, I just want to live with no regrets. You sell a house, you buy a house, you got all sorts of things, and you're like, you know what? No regrets. It's done. We did it, you know? No regrets. I want to be able to live. So when I approach Jesus at the reward seat, I'm not like, oh, Lord, if I could just go back and do it again, I would do it all differently. Really, I would. Now that I see your glory, I see you face to face, I see heaven and the reward, oh, I, if I could just, Lord, Lord, let me go back to earth, and I will make it up double time. You know, how many people want to say that at the reward seat? I bet a lot will. A lot will say, if I only knew what heaven and glory and Jesus was really like, I would have done it different here on earth. And Jesus is telling his disciples, do it different. Start now. Start today. Do it different. He goes on. Verse 26. Woe to you when all men speak well of you. If everybody speaks well of you, what are you doing? You are compromising. Do you know, that's what politicians have to do. They have to compromise a little here, a little there, and then they end up compromising everywhere. And so if a believer is going to compromise and let everybody speak well of you, you know, with, your, with you, I'm saying one thing, and then with another group, I'm saying another, just to keep them happy and keep you happy. I'm people-pleasing, and I'm not Jesus-pleasing. Man, that's what the false prophets were like. The false prophets were like, hey, we don't want to hear any message of judgment and sin and hellfire. We want messages that when we go home, we're singing fantastic, joyful songs. So none of this bad news give us only good stuff. And so the false prophets would be like, oh, God told me that war is coming, but peace comes to you. Well, there you go. That's what we want to hear. Jesus is saying, for a disciple that is not following God's word, not wholeheartedly following their Savior, you're going to be compromising all over the place. And um, this is what the fathers did to the false prophets. So be faithful to Christ. Just look at, look at the world with the right lens. Um, you remember Isaiah 5? Isaiah 5 verse 20 says, Woe to those who call sweet for bitter and bitter for sweet. Woe to those who call light darkness and darkness light. There is a woe for that compromising, and a lot of Christians compromise. They know the Bible is true and right, but they, wi but they won't do it because it's going to cost them friendships, it's going to cost them a raise, it's going to cost them a job promotion, it's going to cost them something, and the cost of that is greater than the cost of obedience. But I will tell you, the cost of non-discipleship is bigger. The cost of not being a disciple of Jesus is far bigger than anything else. But that's the way people like to act. Well, let's go on to the next section, and this might be all we get today is this 27 through 36. Not only do we need to be loyal to Christ and stand up for him uncompromisingly, secondly, we need to be loving like Christ. This is supernatural love. Verse 27 says, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. 
Well, there's different kinds of love. There's eros love, and eros love is the um, emotional, erotic, physical, sensual love between like a man and a woman. That's eros love. Um, then there is storge love. Storge love is, is familial relationships. It's like sisters with sisters, moms and dads with children. It's, it's natural affection. Moms and dads should naturally love their children, and children should love each other, and children should love their parents. Um, then there's phileo love, which is brotherly love. It's, it's camaraderie. It's we're, we're comrades. We're together in this type of love. And then the final love, which is the love that is not dependent on human emotion. All of these other loves are based on feeling. You know, they're, they're largely based on how do I feel about you? Are you? Do I feel like you're my brother or not? Um, agape or agape love, but agape love is is unconditional love that is largely an act of the will. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. It's an act of the will. Do I always feel emotionally loving towards Melissa? I should, but I don't always. Sometimes she irritates me. Not much. Not, not much at all. Very, very, very little does she ever irritate me. But, but once, once in a, a little while... But, but you know what? If I love by emotion only, well, then our relationship is going to be up and down like the weather because I'm going to feel loving and then not feel loving. Then I'm going to feel loving and then I'm not going to feel loving. And if I love her like that, what a horrendous relationship. But when I made a vow to the Lord that I'm going to love my wife like Christ loved the church and it's unconditional, it's not based on her behavior, her attitude, her response, but it's an act of my will because God has loved me with that kind of love and I'm going to give that love to her. Well, then there's some stability that rides the storms. It just plows through the life. It's, it's awesome and it's great and it's divine. It only comes by the new birth. So I'm to love my enemies which is supernatural. You cannot do it with natural affection, but you love your enemies. Now, which enemies are we talking about? I believe the same enemies as the blessings and the woes. It's the, the enemies of the gospel, those who, who hate Jesus, those who are making me hungry, weeping, um, poor, and persecuted and excluded. I'm to love those people. I don't know how many of you saw the movie Sabina, uh, which is uh, Richard Wormbrand, uh, Sabri Sabina Wormbrand, I'm part of Voice of the Martyrs, but her family was murdered in the Holocaust. And there was a particular German guard that murdered her whole family. And over a period of time, her and her husband were up in their flat, and, and for some reason, the husband ended up meeting the Roman or the, the German guard that killed her family. And it was known that he's the one that did it. And, and now it's three in the morning. His wife is asleep in the room, and the man who murdered her family, her mom and dad and sisters and all of that, is in the living room. And, and Richard is sharing the gospel, and, and he says, listen, you murdered my wife's family, and she knows it. It's three in the morning. I'm going to wake my wife up, and I'm going to let her know out of a deep sleep, I'm going to let her know that the murderer of her family is in our house and in the living room. And I will guarantee she will show you the love of Christ. Now that is a test on this woman, isn't it? He knows his wife. He wakes her up. Sabina, Sabina, wake up. Yes, what is it? The German who murdered your family is in our living room. She gets up, she puts on her robe, she goes out there, she goes right to the man, she kisses him on the cheek, and she says, I will make you something to eat. And that man just bawled. Because that is supernatural. That just, you, don't, you don't just do that. It's not a feeling that you're acting on. It is an act of the will that I will love those who persecute me. I will love those who hate me. And he's going to continue on here. Verse 27, not only love your enemies, do good, actively do good things to those who hate you. Like this woman, Sabina, who made breakfast in the middle of the night for the man who killed her family. Do good to those who hate you. 
Now, are we to do good to the general public who hates us as well? Yes, of course. It's the life of Christ. But in the context, we're speaking about the persecution the disciples are going to face. These disciples, these 12 disciples, except for Judas Iscariot, they are going to face some of the harshest persecution and hatred in the entire Roman Empire and in the entire Jewish nation. All of the anger and wrath towards Jesus is falling on the 12 disciples. And when they are so mistreated, they need to respond with good. They need to actively do good things to those persecutors. Now, when, when persecution comes upon us in America, how are we going to treat those who persecute us? Are we going to be like, oh, I hate America, oh, I hate them, I wish I could kill them, I'm going to take up arms and go against them? Or are we going to love those who hate us like Christ loves? This is the challenge of discipleship. He goes on in verse 28, bless those who curse you. So it's not just good actions we do to our, our enemies, but we, we speak well of them. We bless them and we don't curse them. We're not using filthy language. We're, we're blessing them with kind words that will strengthen them and point them to Christ. Will they listen? Maybe not, but maybe they will. Pray for those who spitefully use you. That's from the heart. You genuinely pray and say, Lord, this man hates me. This woman hates me. They're persecuting me. They're, they're mistreating me. They're reviling me. They're making me hungry. They're making me weep. They're making me poor. But Lord, I pray that you would save their soul. Use me as a testimony to be kind and gracious, just like you are kind and gracious to the unsaved. And may they see the light of Jesus and respond to the gospel as I have responded to the gospel. So Lord, save them. Give me the power and strength to live a godly life and a godly example for these people. Do you see for the disciples what this did for them for the next few years as all the world turned against them? No wonder why in Thessalonica, the Thessalonians, after, the, after Paul had been in Thessalonica and believers were popping up all over, the, they were saying, these people have turned Jerusalem upside down and they have come here now. Literally, their influence in Jerusalem was radical with the gospel. And it was well known, these Christians have overturned the city of Jerusalem, and now they're in our city. What a great testimony, isn't it? Wouldn't you love Hermantown to see such a fire for the gospel and such a life of Christ in our church that they would be like, this little church on this corner by the roundabout has so impacted, it's just changed the whole atmosphere of Hermantown. It's like, this is a great place to be because of the believers. That, that's what we, we want. So verse 29, to him who strikes you on, on one cheek, on the one cheek, Offer the other also. I hear people tell me this all the time. Brian, so you're telling me if I come up to you right now and smack you on the face, you're going to turn your cheek and let me hit that side? And I'm like, try it. Why? Because I'm not talking like just anybody coming. In. This is over the sake of Christ, over, over the identifying with Christ. Do you know what it means to be slapped on the cheek? Your, your face, panim in the Hebrew, your face is like the image of God. And... and to slap you on the face is to strike at the image of God. It was the most shaming thing you could ever do. That and spit on somebody is the most shaming thing because you were degrading the image of God, the person as a, as a real person. So to slap somebody was absolutely humiliating. If you excommunicated somebody out of the synagogue, you would have them stand in front of the whole group. Let's say that I'm ex excommunicate, excommunicating Joe from the synagogue because of his Christianity. I would say, Joe... This is your synagogue. You've lived here and grew, grew up here your whole life. Stand up, please. Are you a follower of Jesus? And Joe would say, I am. I follow Jesus the Christ. And then I would say, you're no longer welcome in the synagogue. And I would slap him on the face as a way of shaming. And everybody would be like, oh, you slapped him on the face? That means he is never to show up here again. We don't want to see your face. And then Joe says, you can slap me again. Do you see the humiliation to that? And, but that's, that's, that's just showing your love. Rather than fighting in the synagogue, you turn the cheek and you say, you, you can do that. And then from him who takes away your cloak, they're kicking you out because of your faith in Jesus and they rip off your jacket. You're like, I have another garment and you can have this one as well. Do you know how that impacts the unsaved? 
we would hope it would soften their heart and they would trust Jesus as well. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. So this is a radical way of living, of love. And what an impact. It is the greatest weapon we have to identify ourselves as disciples. John 13, 33 through 35, three times Jesus says, if you are my disciples, you must love one another. To be my disciple and let all the world know that you are my disciples, you must love one another. That's what it comes down to. The world is great at a lot of things, but the one thing they cannot do is love. He goes on. Verse 30, give to everyone who asks of you. This idea of asking, it's not like, I have my garage, picture this, I have my garage open on uh, Tresden Drive, and my neighbor comes by and says, hey, I want the snowblower. I'm like, oh, okay, have my snowblower and take all my shovels too. And then another neighbor comes and says, well, I, I, I see that screwdriver, I want that screwdriver. And I'm like, okay, you can have the screwdriver and I'll give you all the Give me some more tools, pl pl pliers, sockets, uh, I don't know, whatever tools people might have in the garage. I don't have them there. But, um, you know, me and my mechanical skills, um, praise God for mechanics, right? So, it's, and it's like, it's not the idea of you're just giving everything away. And then I'm, then I'm with Melissa, and she's like, do you have a screwdriver? I'm like, no, I gave it all away. That's not the idea of give to everyone who asks. It's like literally give to everyone who demands. If somebody says, I hate you, you're a Christian, I will never be a Christian. And then they, they say, now I want you to give me this or I will kill you or I will do something. I'm like, okay, you can have it. I don't want it back. And by the way, if you want this, um, I'll give you something else as well. It is, it is just a radical way of living where in this culture, it's everything is mine. Everything is mine. Nobody can have anything. It's all mine. Jesus is saying, give to everyone who, who demands of you. And from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. This is, again, we would call it the golden rule, but we want to love and treat others like we would expect to be loved and treated. How does God love and treat us? I need to, I need to treat others like that as well. And then he goes on, and he says, he gives some examples of the unsaved world. Here's how the unsaved world works, verse 32. You know this, but if you love those who love you, who doesn't? We all love our friends. It's just natural to do that. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even unsaved, even the sinners, unsaved people love those who love them. You are no different than the rest of the world if, only you, if you love only your friends. Because that's just an obvious thing. You're just kind of born with that thing. And then he goes on, verse 33, and if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Some unsaved person comes and washes my windows, and I'm like, hey, I'll come over and help you wash your windows. I mean, that's an obvious one. You're just doing good to others because they did good to you. But to do good to others when they hate you and despise you and use you, that's like Christ. That is what the gospel is all about. For even sinners do the same. Verse 34, another example from the world. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, if I expect to get something back when I lend it, what credit is that to me? I'm no different than the world. The bank n never has a problem lending me money, hoping to get something back with interest. They love it. So for me to lend something and expect payment back with some interest, that's just like a worldly thing to do. There's no difference. Verse 35, but here's, the, here's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Love your enemies. He's going to say it again. Do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return. This is for your enemy, people. And your reward will be great. Again, he's speaking about the reward implied. Where is the reward coming? In heaven. If I'm looking for my reward on earth, huh, not only is it transitory and not only is it cheap and shallow, and it, it's, this is not, there's not much here. There's not much reward. Look at our bank account. Look at our home. I mean, it's nice, but it's, it's nothing great. It's, it's nice. I love it. But if this is my reward, that's a sad life. But if, 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 if by the power of God and his word, I follow Jesus and give him my life, I will gain everything in the future. Do you know that anything you grab and hold on to in this world, in this life, you will lose in the end, but everything you release your hold of, 
you get back in the end in far greater measure? It is the question, are we willing to wait for the reward in heaven and do right and good for Christ's sake here on earth? That's the question. And I think personally, and again, this is just a personal note, I think there are not that many believers that are willing to, and I'm not saying about this specific group, by all means, I'm, not, I'm saying in Christianity in general, there's not many that are that devoted followers of Christ, that are true believers. I mean, obviously, you being here on such a regular basis in ministry like you do, you're a different group, which is why I'm privileged to shepherd you. This is the kind of group every pastor wants to shepherd. But typically, most people who would profess salvation in Jesus, they don't live lives that are all about Jesus. Jesus has a part of their life, a little bit here, a little bit there. Keep him in a box. Don't want him to get too involved because, man, he's going to start making radical adjustments in my life, and I don't want that. Rather than, Lord, I'm yours. What will you have me do? You know, the last thing that I ever wanted to do was be a pastor. I don't... I'm not comfortable pre preaching, obviously, <laughs> preaching. Um, being in front of the public, I don't like. Um, that's probably a lot of pride, honestly. But um, public speaking, te all of that stuff is difficult for me. It's not natural, and it's not normal, and it's not even, it's not even well, it is fun. But it's, it's hard. It's a hard fun. It would be, if you just put me in a, in a, if you just said, read books and write book reviews, Man, I'll take that job any day of the week. Just read and write, read and write. But here we go. We're going to finish this up. Your reward will be great, verse 35, and you will be sons of the Most High. It doesn't mean that's how you become a son of the Most High, but you begin to act like your dad. Now, I, I, just, I do have a, such a deep and a great love for my dad, and I'm glad he's with our Savior in heaven because that's he had those hard, hard weeks, really hard last year. But I'll tell you what, I am so much like my dad. I am. I would look at my dad the last 15 years, and he would do things, and I'd be like, oh, Melissa, I do that same thing. I didn't even know it. He, it was great. I was just like, I am just like my dad. And um, if you do these things, you are just like the Father in heaven. You, you then are, you look like a son of the father because you're imitating him and you're acting like him and you're thinking like him. Then he's going to conclude with this, these last thoughts, for he is kind. Don't you agree? God the father is kind to the unthankful and evil. That's just his nature. He's just a kind God. And you know, we Christians, we believers in Jesus, can I say this? Just be nice. Some of the most difficult people that in my life have been believers, that have been the most nasty to me, have been believers. Some unsaved people would never treat me that way that I think believers have treated me. And honestly, I have been just as nasty and, and mean as a believer to others when I really just, I need to be kind. It's just, I, I've sought forgiveness for things like this. Um, so I'm not saying that, it, that I'm perfect here by any means, but the Father is kind to the unthankful and evil, and I must therefore be. Therefore, be merciful to others. You know what mercy is? Not giving them what they deserve. Listen, I'm going to conclude with this. I am going to live my life not demanding payment for all the people that have hurt me. Now, some of you have been hurt very bad by people, and true mercy is not giving them what they deserve because my Father in heaven isn't giving me what I deserve. So those who have hurt me and used me and abused me and slandered my name, I'm not going to demand payment. I'm not going to give them what they deserve. Rather, I'm going to be kind. I'm going I'm to actually do kind things for them in the name of Jesus with hopes that they will also be saved. Do you see the whole perspective here? This is radical. This is not easy to preach because I'm uncomfortable because I am not here. I am not loving like Jesus is loving, and I'm not all sold out like I want to be as a disciple. But I, I want to grow. I want to be there. I want to get there. I want to pursue Christ with my whole life. And that's this whole sermon. Do you see why it's right after the 12? Because these 12 need to hear this because their life's not going to get easy. They're going to need this teaching for the next years of their life until they die and go to heaven. 
Well, we're going to finish up the rest. Um, the, the, the last two points are also phenomenal. I'll probably save those for next Sunday. And tonight we're doing something a little different that'll, I think, be very special with our communion service. So read the rest of the sermon to the disciples, and we'll study that next week. Father, thank you for our time together. And it is so convicting to me to read these words of Jesus. I almost picture myself sitting on that hillside in this level plain um, by the Sea of Galilee, the warm Middle Eastern breezes coming across our faces, and I hear Jesus explaining um, what life for a disciple is like and how we need to respond to this world and how we need to, what kind of character we need to be effective followers of Jesus. We know that this isn't a way of salvation he's speaking of because salvation is a free gift. It is not earned and it's not deserved. It's not based on our behavior. It's based on what Jesus has done for us. And I pray for anyone today who's not a believer in Jesus, that they would abandon their rituals, their law keeping, their good works, get away from their ignorance, and come to believe and have faith in the one true God, Jesus Christ, his death for our sin and resurrection. And then now as a believer, they can with joy, literally like sell everything they have to, to have this treasure, just like we are willing to abandon everything for serving and following listening and obeying the Lord Jesus Christ. So bless this congregation. Watch over our church this week. Thank you for the many ministries. Keep us encouraged and strong. And may we be such a light, people around will wonder who we've been hanging around with, and we can let them know we've been around Jesus. So thank you for your word and for our Savior. In his name, amen. All right, well, God bless you all. Um, I expected to get done with chapter 6 and into 7, but God bless you. We'll continue next week. See you.